Oh, look, that's interesting. She holds her two-handed sword in one hand when she's ready. She's not clenching it, ready to go the entire time. Cute. I'm sure that's uh, accurate to how weapons are held. I certainly wouldn't know. Creeping through. Oh, damn it. Ouch. Took the hit. It's so loud. Oh boy, it's so loud. It's very loud. I hope it's not that loud on the final recording, because whew, it's noisy. Somebody go down. Somebody went down. Oh, what do we... There was some weapon in there, I think. Some cool-looking weapon. Uh... I have no idea what it was, though. So... Please review the footage to determine what cool looking weapon that was. Why don't we take a rest? The key? The cell key? We don't need that. Probably. The stiletto. Doors. Was there a way on the other side there? No. Okay. Fulvano, you've got an absolute complex back here. Was Fulvano the one whose travels we were following at the beginning a workshop key? Experimental notes, the hastily written entry is dotted with blots of ink. I refuse to continue wasting my time with these stitchwork grotesqueries. What work is spent in the granting of rotting corpses, the feeblest spark of life is later tripled in repairs. Truly they come apart at the seams. The sight of them in the corridors has come to disgust me. They hold nothing of the subject's vitality, intelligence, coordination, only a brute obedience. Flesh has too gentle a grasp upon the essence, that much is clear. Little wonder the fools at Brackenbury were willing to pawn these sorry specimens off so cheaply. Adicho the stench. We'll leave the key. And always come back for it if we actually need it at some point. Oh, it requires a key. Hopefully it's this one. Is it this one? It was that one. But let's uh, finish our exploration first. Rotting flesh constructs. Um, everybody's stuck. They're all stuck. Yeah, Apprentice's sneak attack does not apparently require that you have sneak attack. It's just a 15% damage bonus that you get all the time, it appears. Fucking traps. Yeah, we just got our 14th level. For the most part. Most of the team. I wonder what there is to be found over here, because you'd think that the way forward is the way through the locked door. Position yourself so that I can drop some bombs off you. Man, that uh, silent scream is just a brutal thing. It's relatively cheap. It stuns its target. Another trap. This hulking contraption hums with power. Approaching within a few feet sets a peculiar buzzing in our teeth. Whoa. Fulvano, how do you get around this place? How interesting we could have gone directly in that way. Very well. Just one chamber remaining. Oh, trap. Ouch. Come on back this way, won't you? Boom, boom, boom. Shoot, shoot. 
Experimental notes. This discarded note reads, Madicho, three weeks of hard work gone and fully articulated frame with them. These crude materials are more expen- and stable than expected, though no less expensive. I would try a slower process. Ah, more electricity, perhaps. On the bottom of the page, a scrawled agenda reads, too much electricity will require more subjects. Ugh. Animancers, being fucking torturers. It's all a little hard to, uh, to support sometimes. Here we go. An elderly man hunches over a cluttered desk in the back of the workshop. His flesh is pulled tightly around thin, fragile-looking bones, except around the neck where it hangs in loose waddles. He turns as we enter, a scowl already chiseled into his lined face. Back again, I told you. He hesitates, squinting at us from behind, smudged in dusty spectacles. Of course, a fresh fool to replace the last fools. What brings you stomping through my workshop, eh? He draws his words out, looking us up and down. A sneer creeps across his face. I've been questions about Durgan's battery in the White Forge. Straight to business, no nonsense. We appreciate that, don't we? He turns to the bronze golem over his shoulder. Anything for a breather from your endless yammering? The voice echoes from within the golem. He laughs. You would miss me if I were gone, Naimora. Or who would tolerate your barbs and insults? Clear our throat. He turns back to us. But you come seeking the White Forge like they all do. Boys with smooth cheeks and wild dreams. Girls with bright ribbons tied next to their scabbards. His voice rises and falls in the sing-song of mockery. Old men and women, too, seeking a final blaze of glory before they're snuffed out for another return of the wheel. Sound familiar? His smile is rigid as he looks at us, and the corner of his eye twitches. You said all this before, I take it. That's a lot of bitterness. Maybe I should ask you the same thing. Save your breath. He hawks a wad of phlegm from the back of his throat and spits into the corner. I have this conversation with every pig-headed swashbuckler those postenagos in Stalwart send here. Go see Galvino, they say. Surely he'll help you. Must have slipped their minds what a busy and important fellow you are. In the silence that follows, the temperature in the room seems to drop. Galvino glares at her. I should have let them stone you. Would have silenced your endless rattling forever. The hanging folds of skin beneath his neck tremble. Then you'd have naught but those frostbitten inbreds for company. I guess this is what it'd be like if Aloth and Isilmir were two separate people. <laughs> You're upset. There's an old wound with Stalwart, then. He laughs bitterly. The spiteful imbeciles destroyed my career. Ruined years of work. He clears his throat. But let us focus on the reason for your visit, yes? Villagers and their adventurers hammer and pry at the battery, as if they were laying siege to some moldering lord's keep. He swats the air in front of his face. But those stones were laid by some of the finest builders ever to have lived. Disciples of Abaddon, in the truest sense. They will not fall by the whims of any kith. And the door itself, it is infused with living essence. He holds his hands before him, and his eyes are wide with wonder. The dwarves themselves must have had a way of getting in. Belfetto, this is the crux of the matter. He claps his hands together. The Pagrunen of Durgan's battery perished with their neuron keep, victims of a violent disagreement among their commandants. His mouth twists into a wicked grin. Surely in the village you have heard stories, no? Disappearing caravans, tracks in the snow, screams from the high towers. He pauses, watching our expression with a racket to his glee. The work of spirits still trapped in the battery, and a testament to those impenetrable walls. He wraps on the mortared stone of his own home. But the door of the keep, the one the Pargrunen filled with essence, was made to listen, to recognize its masters. Does so it need the door to recognize me? Traditional Aptapo cultures revolved around the language. Words revealed who they were and where they were from. That is why you need a Kantek. He holds up a twitching finger. I guess. I believe those are anthems of sorts. He nods. Ah, that's the simple explanation. A cantec is a statement of purpose, a declaration of identity. Each is unique to its stronghold. Ah, seal your door with a key of words and any liar can talk his way through. There's nothing built of words that won't break when the slightest stress is applied. Thus, to enter a fortress like Durgan's battery, he would stand at the gate and recite its cantec. He spreads his arms, his face aglow. Very well. Where would I learn this Kantek? To learn the Kantek, you must speak with one of the dwarves of Durgan's battery. A shame they're all dead, no? He rubs his hands together, pacing. But no doubt their souls live on in one or two of the villagers of Stalwart. Like fine wine poured into a cheap pot, the Rijin curls his lips. He wags a finger at the ceiling. But to identify them, that is the first problem. You would need the skills of an animancer. I'm a watcher. 
The golem swivels her head sharply toward us. Her mask of a face and glass eyes behind it betray no emotion, but it seems as if she's watching us carefully. A watcher, Tiveros. If this is true, then you'd find a salt descended from Durgan's pathory, no question. But the greater difficulty remains. Calvino rubs his gaunt, whiskered cheeks. You would have to learn the contact from the dormant soul, and to do that, you would have to awaken it. And this awakening would be permanent, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. Whoever you awaken will live with the memories and the personality of a past life. Maybe peacefully, maybe not. His bony shoulders rise in a shrug. That is why you must pay attention to the soul you would awaken, no? It is a monumental thing to impose on another. But these are the very people who wish to rediscover the White Forge, Verus. He removes his spectacles and polishes the dirty lenses with his tunic. Awaken someone, how would I do that? An awakening is merely the jolting of a dormant soul into consciousness. He makes a bursting motion with his hands, splaying his fingers wide. When such things happen normally, it is because something has reminded the subject of a past life, often violently so. He spanks his worth bench with surprising vigor. Thus, to awaken one of the former dwarves of Durgan's battery, you'll need to address that soul, preferably by name. He folds his hands together, steepling his fingers. But show some care. When you examine these souls, whatever it is you watchers do, you may see images, memories. He leans forward, his back hunched. These are moments of special import. What you see will tell you much about the person, and perhaps the condition in which they waken. He raises his hoary eyebrows and tilts his head back. Awaken them from a traumatic memory, and who knows? Maybe they awaken thirsty for blood. Or maybe you awaken someone else. He cackles again. Here. This has been tuned to the eon of Durgan's battery. Use it near the villagers, and it should tell you if one has a soul old enough to have come from the battery. He rummages around and produces an unfamiliar device. So the Cantec is all I need? Who can say? None have yet opened Durgan's battery. He raises his hands, palms up. But the one that came before you, I think they got close. You may wish to find them to see if they're discovered. I found what's left of them a journal and a title. Most interesting, he adjusts his spectacles and peers at the tile. They spend many days at the battery door. This looks like something that once belonged there. He taps the tile. I see. Thank you. You have much work ahead of you, as do I. He nods and turns back to his desk. I'm going with him. The golem looks between us, her neck turning on its oil joint. You? Go to stalwart? Is this your macabre sense of humor? Or has something gone into rust in that beautiful head I crafted? Lavino stares at her agape. No one will bother me while I'm with him. Besides, I can help him find people in stalwart. The golem's burnished face is eerily impassive. You haven't been to Stalwart in thirteen years, and this watcher sees souls. What help could you be? Besides, I have need of you here. You owe whatever remains of your wicked life to me. A frown sours on his lips, and he taps his chest with a crooked finger. The golem says nothing, but her essence smolders. Resentment rises from her in shimmering waves. She swivels her head back toward us. What's the story between you two? Calvino laughs, coughing and wheezing. This charming specimen is a convicted murderer. The devil of Karak, she's called. Mighty fine of you to start with my good qualities. And you wonder why we don't get more visitors. Killed over a dozen people before they finally caught up to her in Stalwart. Perfect company for lonely camps and mountain passes, no? He nudges at us, all while grinning wickedly at the motionless golem. Hey, I know how to start a campfire. The only reason she's not a frozen corpse is because I convinced the old mayor to let me try an experiment. A shadow passes over his face. You put a person's soul in a metal body. He leans back, raising his hands. Into a work of art. Look at this. Craftsmanship worthy of a jeweler. He traces the scroll work that runs along the golem's jaw. Fully articulated joints, capable of grasping a pen and writing her own name. He grabs her hands and delicately bends her tapered fingers. And of crushing your throat. He snatches her hand away. Show me another smith anywhere in the Deerwood who is capable of such delicacy and precision. She is a masterpiece. Calvino steps back and takes a longer look at her. Why'd you build her? Why build a fortress or a village or anything? To make something that keeps that... A disgusted sigh rattles in his throat. It was the early days of the legacy. My peers in the colleges of animancy were filling the hollowborn with the souls of animals. He pauses, scratching at his chin. I thought there was a better way. He is silent for several seconds, his gaze growing distant. One with a Plum Academy job back in Salona, don't forget that part. He glares at her with narrow eyes. Why is she called the Devil of Karak? She committed her first crime in the village of Karak, burned a family alive in their home, he shrugs. Did the same thing in a half dozen other villages, but the name stuck. I take it your experiment didn't go over well with the rest of the village. Here we go, she rolls her eyes, rasping them against her sockets. 
They were going to stone her anyway. Why not allow her to be put to some useful purpose? His lips curled back from yellowing teeth. My life's ambition, to serve somebody's useful purpose. I approached Mayor Sineo and then begged. He saw the potential and allowed me the privilege of attempting my little experiment. He sneers at the words with the indignity they recall. His shoulders are stooped and his teeth bared. Then I accomplished what few animancers have even dreamed of. No academic support, no patron, just me in the middle of nowhere. He jabs a finger into his concave chest. Now you got them all wound up. I transferred a fully intact soul from a living subject to a fabricated body. She retained her personalities, her memories, all of it. He claws at the air with one thick veined hand. If the villagers saw only a stolen corpse, he throws up his hands. Aren't you afraid she'll murder you? Gavino shrugs. She may be mad, but she's no fool. She wouldn't survive long on her own. If the villagers didn't send a hunting party after her, the elements would claim her. Her joints and mechanisms require maintenance, and she cannot perform all of it herself. Please, reminding me, in case I get any bright ideas. That's all I wanted to know. She's a fine specimen, her personality notwithstanding. He waves one hand in a circular motion. The golem says nothing but her essence smolders. I like her to travel with me. Que? No, 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 you don't know what you ask. He shakes his head, waving his hands. This woman, the devil of Karak, she was a notorious murderer, burned people alive all over the region. Besides, she works for me. After all, I am the one who preserved her. He straightens his back and looks us up and down, taking our measure. Let me parade her around town. It'll infuriate those villagers. You'd like that, wouldn't you? He scratches his jaw. So you'll get use of the devil's services, and I get the satisfaction of knowing those stiff necks are sweating through their small clothes, eh? He smiles, but a, he sighs, but a smug grin has already worked its way across his face. He'd say deal. She turns to Galvino. Fine price for a blacksmith striker. Suppose I should be flattered. Whomst? I guess, Heravius, fine. And there you have it, a bargain, he gives a sardonic grin. A moment, you are going back to Stalwart, yes? Perhaps you could do me a favor. He gives us a thoughtful frown, tell me about it. He weaves his fingers together. There is a man in the village named Grind, the head fisherman. The rest of Stalwart kisses his feet because he fizz their stinking plates with Speckleback. But I know he's not as virtuous as he seems. What exactly would you want me to do to him? Seems you have a history with him. That self-righteous meddler engineered my eviction from the village. He turned them all against me. Now I want him to feel the scorn of those mush-brained imbeciles. What exactly do you want me to do to him? Humiliate him, of course. Show his neighbors what he truly is and let him live with the disgrace. He points vaguely in the direction of the village. He's always been a reaper sponge addict. Just got good at hiding it once his sainted sister died and left him in charge of the fishery. But he keeps a stash in the fishery, sneaks in at night when the others have gone home, and emerges sluggish and red-eyed a few hours later. I want you to expose him. Go to the fishery after dark when it's empty. Find his reaper sponge and show it to Ren and Guild. He holds up a hand. Do not answer me now. But when you return to that festering eyesore and smelly stink of fish that hangs in the air, consider what I've said. Besides, you appreciate a good joke, don't you? If Eros, this will be a good one. But be sure to approach the fishery by night when it's empty. It will give you no end of trouble if they see you stealing during the day. I have questions about the devil. No, not that. Tell me about how to awaken someone. You're the watcher, so you'd know better than you want the virus. You must find a soul descendant, talk to the villagers, look into their souls, whatever it is you do. Remind it of its old name. I want to know more about the expeditionaries who came before. As would I, but there is little to tell. They never gave their names. He tugs at his whiskers. But they seem to know more about the battery than the others, which is unusual because they did not seem like typical adventurers. He raises his snowy eyebrows. Their hands were smooth and marked with ink, not scars. And they traveled light, unusually so. What were those constructs I encountered in your workshop? Other projects, they are none of your concern. He waves a hand and quickly looks away from us. You seem pretty eager to change the subject, he mutters furiously under his breath, raising his hands to the ceiling. For years I've been trying to create another like the Devil of Karok. Yet those post-Denagos in Star Wars destroyed my machinery. His drooping skin trembles with rage. Now I can only create these broken, mindless things. The Devil remains my most perfect creation. His lips twist with a taste of something bigger, bitter. Wait, where have you found the souls to create the other golems? Smugglers, slavers, fugitives. The kind of riffraff that passed this way. Rarely missed, and good work to keep my little devil busy. Why do you need more golems? I can't present the devil of Garok to the acad academies, can I? A mad woman and a murderer? No, I need to bring a success to the republics. Never mind. All right. 
Fuck you, Galvino. What's the devil's deal? Does she like spears in particular? Is she a big fan of the spear? What if we just looked for uh, our highest value weapon? Wendwalker, quarterstaff, freezing lash, guarding, increased reach, and superb. You could give her that. Stunning of might plus one and fine. This is of superb quality, which I believe is the third upgrade level. Let's give her a quarterstaff. Oh, it's got a fancy glow on it. That's lovely. I'm all for it. She's going to be our staff girl. Keep an eye on the Devil of Karank. The black marbles of her eyes scrape against their sockets as she looks at us. Gavino said you murdered several people before he transferred you. Effigy's eyes, that man loved to talk. Her eyes roll in their sockets. Tell me why you killed those people. If it's sane and logical reasoning you're wanting, you're going to be disappointed. Ain't no sense in any of it. I've heard parts of your story from others. I'd rather hear the rest from you. A soft hissing noise comes from the bronze golem. We recognize it as a sigh. Mayhap you've heard of Cold Morn. It was a quiet, forgettable patch of the woods. Till a pack of rabid clodhoppers set it afire. The fingers of one hand twitch and click against one another in a pair of spastic motions. That was what started the purges. Dear Woodens killing their own. Yeah, they were the ones who let Red Saris through. You're upset. A sudden burst of heat flares from her seams as her essence surges and boils. A farmer on the other side of the mountains woke up one day with his head all aflame and took it for the gibbering speech of his god. And so did a few thousand of his countrymen, so when he tired of his vorless fields and marched west, a horde of armed hicks followed. You're talking about Widewin and the Saints' War. A bunch of fool nonsense is what I'm talking about, but others have called it the same. If you know that much, then you've heard of Cold Morn. Ours was the village that let a few thousand of Widewin's troops pass through. You were from Cold Morn? When I heard what happened out there after the war, I couldn't believe my ears. Fine line between couldn't and wouldn't. Why didn't you try and stop the Raid Sarens? I think that that was meant to respond to a different companion line where they say they couldn't stop the... wouldn't stop them. Uh, I guess you didn't have much choice. Telling a few hundred, Try telling a few hundred crazy dear woodens. We got news of the Raid Sarens coming through the mountains. Begged the Duke for help, we did. She sweeps one bronze palm across another, metal screeching. Didn't send us so much as a bare ass novitiate. They went towns with full coffers and they went to towns with full coffers and lofty connections. He crosses her arms over her plated chest. So we let Widewind soldiers pass, left him for the Duke to wrangle on his own terms. We were a soft clank as she flicks her wrist. The cold morn was purged in retaliation. It was after the Godhammer made a fine grit out of Widewind, when Deer Woodens were running on rage and looking for something to burn. We catch glimmers and glints in her seams as a razor thin wire pulled tight within her body. They came at dark. Hundreds of folk, every one of them mourning someone lost in the war. A dry chuckle tickles her throat. Must have decided that it was our duty to escort their dead back to the wheel. They didn't light their torches till they had us surrounded. Time we saw them, there was a ring of fire closing around us. She pauses and a mechanism in the back of her skull clicks dully. I woke, ran to the window. Whole village were a maze of flames. Couldn't see anything for the smoke and the screams. Her thumb spasms to a strange rhythmic beat. Most ran for the streets, got caught by the mob. Others hid, let their houses burn down around them. I'm so sorry, that's terrible. You're the only person in the Deerwood who thinks so. Me, I'm surprised that Duke didn't make our massacre a festival day. What does that have to do with your crimes? Hunting down all the men and women that took part. Thought that much was clear. But you only killed people who attacked Coldmorn, right? Sure. Her voice is flat and expressionless as her face. You want me to tell you right straight? I found the men and women who destroyed my village, and I burned their houses down around them. Sometimes they was alone. Sometimes it wasn't. Uh, what exactly did you hope to accomplish? She pauses. It were a mob that destroyed our village, but it was just one man that burned my family's house. I kept hoping that I'd get to him as I was working my way through the rest of those maggots, no matter how, no matter now, I suppose. A sigh rattles out of her bronze skull, but her essence whips and twitches as restless as a cat's tail. You and Galvino have an unusual relationship. Only kind to have with someone like him or me, she crosses her arms. You resent him. 
No other way to feel about a man who flayed my living soul. Metal squeals as she shifts her folded arms. How long have you known each other? Round about thirteen years. Too long, you ask me. He claimed he made you. He'd spread butter on bread and claim he made something. Never been accused of modesty, that man. Her eyes roll wildly. He managed to stuff my soul into this heap of bronze, true enough. Maybe that makes him a genius. Also makes him a son of a bitch. She drums her fingers along one stretched bicep. Did you ever consider murdering him? Every day. Just kept putting it off. Not like either of us was going anywhere. What exactly did you do for him? She regards us for several seconds and shrugs. Looked after his tools, cleaned the workshop, swung the sledgehammer, oh, and snatched up travelers for his soul tinkering. What are you talking about? All those other golems, where'd you think they came from? She cocks her head. Don't worry, they were all bad folk. Thanks for telling me. Just so you know, you got a real professional working for you. Let's talk about something else. Yeah, I've had enough of him, too. She drops her arms. Why'd you want to come with me? Stalwart's great this time of year. Bareth spells in bloom for a good five days, and the mountain squall actually blows the fish stench away from town. She turns away, clacking the fingers of one hand against her palm. Better than staying at Galvino's, anyway. I get the feeling you're not welcome in Stalwart. She shrugs. I got a reputation. People in these little villages ain't the most open-minded. Did you murder someone there? Not yet. You answered that pretty quickly. Something not telling me? Plenty. But nothing you need to know. Right, I'm supposed to believe that you came all the way to Stalwart 13 years ago for the scenery. Believe what you want. I killed a lot of folk, but none of them was in Stalwart. Rather discuss another matter. About Durgan's battery. Just because I made a metal don't mean I got any special fondness for smiths and forges. She flicks the bronze of her forearm, producing a dissonant ring. You know anything about it? No more than what Galvino already told you. Any thoughts on which villagers I should check? For fancy dwarven poetry? None of them ever struck me as especially literate, so whichever you can stand to get close to. She shrugs with the rattling of metal. And that's on you. I lost my sense of smell 13 years ago. Do you remember any of the other expeditions that came to Galvino? Nothing specific. Everyone looks about the same when they got their fingers up their noses. She pauses thoughtfully. Then her head snaps forward in a tiny, quick moment of realization. Only the last group, one before you, there was something different about them. Three of her fingers clench and spasm. Couldn't put my finger on it, but they was dangerous. Almost felt the hair on the back of my neck. She runs her hand along the smooth, segmented bronze of her neck. Ain't felt that way about anyone else walking through Galvino's door, that's for sure. What's your area of expertise? Murder, tracking, and the best materials for kindling. Those are my area, more my area of expertise. What was your life like before the Saints War? Or much to say about it, by my reckoning that means it was pretty good, she nods thoughtfully. Ma was a trapper, taught me to set snares and dress game. Dad was a tinker, never had his patience, but it were fun to watch him work. My brothers and sister, they was good folk too. Pardon me's glad they ain't here to see me now. Her face is as blank as ever, but her essence ebbs and writhes. She turns away. That's all. Weren't much to say. No, that was the fisherman's penance. Now we never did read that uh, journal that we got from the uh, what's her name? Um, yes, yeah, Leaden Key Expedition Journal. That's what we were looking for. Are the robes and hood useful to us at some point here? Let in key robes. Let me see. It does not appear that we'll need it, but I guess... Might as well just hold on to it there. I don't know. I don't know. Muscle effects suspended over five seconds. We own his van braces. 5% of misses converted to grazes, 3 DR bypass, and plus 5 damage reduction. Uh, why don't we give it to the devil? I don't know. Why not? It's there. Oh, is this the weapon that we found? The exceptional rapier? The one that looked kind of funny and I thought might be special, but I guess it was just an exceptional rapier. What are these? Fruit. Plus 5 max endurance for 5 minutes on eating fruit. Delicious. And... The one that got away. Keep an eye on the Devil of Carrick. Yes, she's still looking for her own family's killers. I don't know, you think we should let Galvino live? He's kind of an asshole. Uh, he's kind of out here 
stealing and murdering people the light of dawn a raid seren morality play i think not although i'm curious about the raid seren mindset they seem like weird people they seem like real weirdos and creepazoids like uh not our kind of people at all slavers that they are that's not the exit the exit's a staircase up right there it is a ladder Adair, you were a military man. Ever consider making a career of it? Says Medea. I did for a while, then I heard you could make money shoveling pig shit, and I thought that sounded better. <laughs> At least it'd get you out of the deer wood. <laughs> Have we found everything we were looking for out here? We got the bound... Did we get the bounty? I don't know if we found that, uh, the Bareth cultists, right? We found that one group of Bareth cultists that we assumed was the people we were looking for, but apparently not. Let's throw some saves in, just in case there's a bunch of deranged vampires waiting to snag us. Aha! There she is! Not even any conversation. Classic. Promote you as well. Everybody's melee now. It's a different world. Let's generate some magic. Yeah, that's right. You. I said, you. Are you crowd controlled? Oh, he's confused. For five seconds. Uh-oh. Oh, no, the devil's down. Uh-oh. We might be in trouble. Started some knockdowns going. Yeah. Continue those coming out, please. Uh, you? Oh no. Oh, we can't select him either. He's confused. No longer confused. Minor Avatar. Single ally is revived and healed. Nice. Healed everybody, too. Let's get a little bit more focus. How long is she still knocked down for? Still another five seconds. Jesus Christ. This thing is a nightmare. Crunch. There we go. No more worshipping Bareth on our clock. Prayer against treachery. That's an awful lot of effects on this thing. Prayer against treachery, immunity to charmed and dominated, grants a plus affliction, but not automatic. I'm looking forward to the turn-based styles of two. We'll see how much I like it, but, uh, we killed Mesla. We turned to Taildor now. In the trampled, bloody slush around this toppled wagon, we spy tracks leading back south along the path. Ice Troll. Is everyone melee now? Why are you using? I guess he had been for a long time, hadn't he? I guess everyone is melee except for our host. That should definitely not cause huge problems. Knock him over. Knock him down, knock him out. Take him down. Whew. Uh, can you go further this way? Oh, you can. A pendant. Unconquerable. Plus two intellect while endurance is above 25%. Plus 25% focus gain while endurance is above 50%. Well, that's all the time, because we never take any damage back there. That's astonishing. Of course, we already had a 10% fo focus gain bonus toy. Uh, are we wearing anything else of intellect right now? Resolve, perception, dexterity, reflex, spirit bane, might. I'm wearing any boots. Um, bloodthirst. I suppose we might as well throw that on somebody. Can the devil wear helmets? She can. 
Thought she might be like a godlike. Can she wear armor? Nope. The inventor Galvino constructed the devil of Kerox ornate body out of forged bronze and laid with intricately silver panels and featuring elaborate etchings in the Valian style. Held together with myriad small brass pins and hinges, it is a marvel of craftsmanship and serves as an ambulant vessel for her soul. Whether for aesthetic or functional reasons, Galvino fitted her face with onyx eyes. Their smooth finish flecks the devil's surroundings impassively, though occasionally a glint of imperfections within the stone or some deep-seated spark of malevolence shine through. Ah, yes, the leaden key journal. This leather-bound journal is embossed with an image of a key. Most of the pages are filled with rust-brown stains or writing too small to read, but we're able to decipher a passage near the end of the journal. Couldn't detect how the front door opens, even after she pried the iron tile from the relief. The more I consider it, the surer I am that the old Valian was right. We'll have to dispose of him, but we can't afford to act until we've destroyed the White Forge. Even his meager knowledge was a revelation to us. And if he's right, we've got to hope that the cantic he speaks of was written down somewhere. We decided to strike camp and search for an area, the area for books, records, anything. Anything's better than sitting in the middle of this blizzard. Could be you can find it written down somewhere. Or it could be you need the powers of a watcher to find it. What's in here? Oh, it's up here. There's a bow. As we grab the bow, it vibrates with a strange and familiar energy. Searching the pack, we find the silver arrow we found lodged in an injured winter wolf. As we hold the bow and arrow together, the arrow suddenly snaps into place. We hear a crackling hum, and the pale ribbon of light begins to form between the ends of the bow. We pull the arrow back. We feel a very solid resistance. That is a soul-bound weapon, and I would love to be able to give it to, say, the grieving mother. But we don't have her, nor are we likely to anytime soon. Stormcaller. Uh, we can give it to Durrance. Maybe we should put Durrance in the back row again, since we're so overwhelmed. Enchant. No, not enchant. Soulbind. Bind. So, oh, Chanter, Cypher, and Ranger only. God damn it. Well, it was a good idea. Foiled. Chanter, Cypher, and Ranger only. Could make good use of that, surely. The Grieving Mother could make good use of it. Gavino's cabin. Taragar's camp. Oh, he was the merchant, right? There you go. See if there's anything else to say to him now. Then we'll head back to Stalwart. Hey, Taragar. Nothing to say. Can we leave via here? Yes, we can. Durgan's Battery. Stalwart Village. Didn't think I'd miss this place. Had that much right. A tail door. The thermal pearl you saw was really a lagufef egg. The little creature sticks its head out of our pack and looks at Taildor with bulging blue eyes. His jaw flaps soundly for a second. I've never seen one so small, but the fellow looks downright tame. How about I buy it from you? The performers that pass through town would take an interest in something like this. Don't do it. No, I'm keeping him. Whatever you say, just watch your fingers when he gets big. I'm not going to sell him into functionally slavery. I'm still looking for someone to take care of those dangerous folk roam in the area, if you're up to it. The Gleaming Society is no more. Plenty of folk will be happy to hear it. Last thing we need is another big war. Take this. Mesla, the sisterhood of the Slake Skull, is dead. Kinda ironic, isn't it? She went around killing people for Bareth, and in the end, that's what... Oh, uh, never mind. <laughs> Just take the bounty. He passes a bag that rattles with coin. I've heard some new reports of dangerous folk around. Maybe you'd be interested in going after them, too. That'd be the Disciples of the True Flame and the Old Dunred Hunting Lodge. He shakes his head. The others he handled are lambs by comparison. Tell me about the Disciples. I don't know what to make of them, but the word is it's a group of dragon cultists. I know that sounds bizarre. I didn't believe it myself until I heard they were torching outposts up north of Maiden Falls. For clearing a nest of worms, they said. Last I'd heard, they made camp near Longwatch Falls. They couldn't be that hard to spot. How about the old Dunred Hunting Lodge? The deer ends with too much time and money. They travel around hunting monsters for sport. They leave a mess of wrecked property and dead bodies, kith, I mean, in their wake. They've been charged with murder and general mischief in Defiance Bay, New Hamar, and a dozen other towns in between. Someone saw them hunting in the Russet Woods, so you might look for them there. Sure. We make sure that we don't, uh, because we got to turn in this quest as well. Over here, Feta. I found your goods. You saved my hide, Stray. I can't thank you enough, but I hope you'll take this here, as promised. Thanks again. With a little luck, I'll trade these blizzards in for a sea breeze soon enough. Yeah. Oh, the devil's got something to say. Village was a touch livelier when I saw it last. Ain't saying much, though. Her head swivels as she looks around. Hey, what do you remember about Stalwart? Maybe they saw you coming and went to the hide. Long as they don't come back with rocks in hand, that's fine by me. Why'd you want to come back, anyway? 
Anything's better than Galvino's workshop. You ain't heard the old buzzard sing. She turns away again. Anyway, what about you? We've seen lots coming through trying to crack the battery, but no watchers. Stalwart needs my help. She chuckles. The do-gooder of Deerwood, you're a rare breed these days. But don't let me go keep you from sights and sounds of Stalwart. They're easy to miss. She rests her hands on her hips and turns to look around. I wanted to ask you something else. Uh, should we rest until nightfall and see about the... Read his soul. Back to warm your hands, eh? What can I do for you? You see a room, dark and damp, a cellar. It looks like part of the inn rather than an old fortress. Through Hefferick's eyes, we admire rows of gleaming bottles, recently dusted and polished. As we step back from the shelves, we look on with satisfaction as a pressure plate concealed in the stone floor. You got the look of someone with teeth around a secret. Her cold fingers locked around our arm. Her black eyes search us. I wouldn't call it a secret. More like a mysterious thing he doesn't like to talk about. Glad I'm not the only one who knows, who knows not to trust your kind, Watcher. You do well not to trust hers. You all right? I won't serve you if you're already drunk, you know. Looks like he is not the past. A wreath of ashes. Remembrance ashes. Ten is a grieving mother. Atsuro. Should we visit at to see what Atsuro wants? Um, we should go check with the headswoman to see if we can turn anything in over there. Renengild. Examine her soul. I take it you've met Galvino. Renengild glances at the devil of Karak, her eyes narrowing. Our awareness settles beneath her skin. We feel ourselves looking through her eyes, one at upon a time-faded memory. We're standing at the inn. The room is stifling, but it's the body heat of so many furious villagers, not the fire that's drawn sweat from our pores. Our husband waits by the door about as far as he can get from the assembly. He holds Uldrich, whose cheeks are bright as he watches the adults bicker with wide, fearful eyes. We never realized how badly our neighbors stank, but something rank and repulsive rises from them as they back together in this room. How much did the old snake pay you, Synod? It's grinned, the head fisherman jabbing a furious finger toward the back of the room. Synod, our erstwhile mayor, squirms in a corner, pinned to the accusing stares of the entire village. Oh, those eyes. Their cruel porcine eyes, and they're watching Synod with the dumb gluttony of hogs staring at fodder. The only sight that turns our stomach more is Synod himself, trying to wiggle free of his own lies. Mestre Givano and I, Galvino and I, came to an agreement, a lump bobbed in his throat. It was for the good of Stalwart, I thought. A woman in the middle of the crowd waves her fist. You thought you'd let a killer walk among us? Cries of fierce agreement rise from the others. What began as collective grumbling is swelling and congealing like storm clouds. We look back at our husband. He's whispering to Ulrich. When we catch his eye, he directs a silent supplication to us. Let's go. A wet smack draws our attention back to the other end of the room. Someone's thrown a potato, and Synod cringes and rubs his jaw. We want to shout for them, at them all for this nonsense and waste, but we know this is about to get worse. Sinawa will have blood, and Galvino in his horror had the sense to flee already. We turn again, and our husband is beckoning us with swift chopping motions, but what stops our breath is Ulrich. His little eyes are fixed on the churning mob. And we knew ever since we started hearing about those hideous purges that he'd see something like this one day. Did it have to be so soon? It's what drove that devil woman to madness, and now his little eyes have gotten big, big enough to swallow the whole scene, and now he's seeing you as part of it. We want to leave now, but if we do, this is what our boy will remember. Cowardice and madness. About people, about Stalwart, about us. The people around us jostle and bark in their rage. They're dangerous animals, but animals nonetheless. They just need to be led. So we push our way to the end of the room, where Synod trembles in a puddle of his own piss. Enough, our voice boils up from our throat. The others fall silent, watching us. They listen, dumbly trusting, as we turn Synod's death sentence into an exile. No one contradicts us when we explain that he's going to march out of this village alone and into whatever miserable hand that will have him. They silently agree when we explain that their hands are too clean for the likes of him. But there's something else forming behind their eyes, a kernel of trust and dependence. We feel it curling around us, casing us like a pearl does sand. We only wanted to spare Synod's life, not volunteer for his job. We see so much fear simmering just beneath their expressions. Fear at godmen marching through the mountains, at dear woodens and their purges, at dying the slow and lonely death of a ghost town. And we see their grateful reassurance mirrored in Uldric's expression. Maybe this place is hopeless, but we realize that we can't leave it any more than we could leave our boy. The only person who isn't looking at us is our husband. He's shaking his head, his eyes on the door. He 
You retreat from the memory. Vivid though it is, it has nothing to do with Durgan's battery. That was a lot. We're not going to talk about the ogres at all? It's just enough to read his soul. We reach for his soul and we find ourselves staring at a fence post lying in a filthy slush of frozen mud. Snow gathers around our legs and trickles into our boots. We hold the wooden chisel in one thumb hand and a mallet in the other, kneeling over the fence post we get to work. Hour after hour we hammer, feeling the tools grow heavy in our grasp as our breath fogs our vision. We want to do better work than this. Can do better work than this. But no one's building new houses in Stalwart. The last table we crafted was put into the fishery, and pike and trails now trace the fine dovetail joints we so lovingly carved. Now we bend the stockade, because that's what's needed. The chisel slips, skidding alongside our hand. We gasp. We hold up our hand and see, much to our relief, all five fingers wiggling back at us. We need to get out of this town. We pull back. He's still staring into the fire, seemingly lost in his own memories, too. Weren't we supposed to be able to ask around about that, uh, sold, or who knows what it is, but that, uh, hat that we found a piece of? No one so far has seemed to have an opinion. Talk to Reifald, read his soul. The smoky path peels away, and the brisk air gives way to the acrid stench of smoke. A dark cloud billows up from the remnants of a burning house at the far edge of a rocky field. We're low to the ground, held in place, and above us the wind tongues embers back and forth like firebugs. The vision in our left eye is clouded, such that the figure standing over us is a collection of rough smears of black cast in silhouette by the fire. Not so brave now, are you? A dark shape swings toward our face, and the subsequent burst of agony jars us out of the memory and back into our own skin. What, did I spill something on myself? Nasty. Wouldn't want to awaken that. Hello. Tana. Read her soul. We feel her essence humming and buzzing. Another personality and set of memories lies dormant within her soul, convulsing as if in fitful sleep. The contours of that dormant soul are sharp, ragged. As we reach out for it, it seizes us violently. We're standing in a darkened feast hall. Sturdy tables and benches have been stacked against the door at the far end of the room. We know it won't be enough. A few dozen other dwarves from our tunneling crew wait with us, shovels and pickaxes in their shaking hands. One man turns to us. Zenova, please. If we go now, we can get behind the barricade. We won't do any good here. He's right, and we hear agreement in the quiet murmur of the others. But Arms Warden Marun ordered us to hold our ground here. Yet in those rising whispers, we hear the opening bars of mutiny. We've never tolerated insubordination from our crew, and we aren't about to start. So we heft our pickaxe and swing it into the man's skull. He collapses, and the others fall silent. The acrid odor of urine rises from his body. We're going to go down fighting. Anyone who feels differently can settle with me right now. Our voice is hoarse from the hours of shouting orders, but no one moves. They cast their eyes down in flickering torchlight. Something thuds against the door. The others raise their weapons, picks, shovels, and a few swords, but they don't dare flinch. Our own pulse pounds at our temples. We pull back from Tainted's soul, but we feel Zenova's wrath and ferocity tugging at us still. Her essence thrashes, lashing out at an unseen enemy. Zenova is powerful, but dangerous too. Her fury has anchored her to old and threatening memories. We consider that there may be others we could awaken. Tana, however, seems unaware of any of this, and she blinks back at the cloudy, placid eyes. Hmm. Let's see. Is this a dangerous person to awaken? Seems like Tana might end up going mad. Got to speak up. My hearing isn't what it was. Awaken Zenova and remember your battle in the feast hall. A tremor passes through Tana's face, and then her rumpled skin goes slack. After a racking cough, she blinks like someone slowly coming to consciousness. That name. It carries memories of death, war, fury, the taste of blood. What do you want with it? If she attacks and I have to punch an old lady, I don't want to hear about it from anybody. There was nothing I could do. This one's far stronger. It will devour her from within. Replace weakness with strength. Durance glances at her and lowers his voice. But it may not be to your benefit. A true warrior was buried beneath. It would explain the dead bodies all around her. Look out. Don't take a nose to smell trouble on this one. I need to enter Durgan's battery. What trickery is this, stranger? You think a Pargrin would so easily betray her own people? Her hands clench and unclench around an imaginary weapon. The Nova's essence stirs with the same battle steady for furor we sense in her memory from Durgan's battery. She's dangerous. Beneath the Nova, Taina's overwhelmed consciousness struggles. The last of her people disappeared hundreds of years ago. There's nothing to betray. You'd never betray Durgan's battery. Your loyalty is plain to see. 
She blinks. You speak like one who knows me. Her fury abates and confusion seeps into its place. We test its contours for purchase. Then you're not one of Zoldan's visiting merchants or Exandru's foreign zealots. You're one of us. Even as Inova speaks to the older woman, we feel Taina's consciousness recover and steady itself. Would a stranger... I take my orders from Armswoman Maroon, the same as you. Would a stranger know of the gilded halls of the Battery, of the Shrine to Abaddon, the patron of all who labor? She nods in recognition. Then let us share the words of our bond, brother. Hammers of Durgan ring loud. May the anvil's deep music resound. Walls of the Battery safeguard our works from marauder and wilder alike. Abaddon's faithful travail by the forge and the fires that brighten the ore. She takes a deep breath and her eyelids droop. Inside the old woman's body, the personalities and memories of Zenova and Taina vie for dominance. Taina is beginning to resurface, but Zenova is stronger still, her rage and panic temporarily diminished. We perceive both pieces of the soul as something fluid and malleable. Um, let's push Zenova down, allowing Taina to reemerge. She lets out a great sigh, expelling the rage and trauma of her past life like so much vapor. When she looks back up at us, her eyes are bright with new energy. Did I nod off? My, but I had the strangest dream. She shakes her head and dusts her hands on her trousers. So much work to be done. Pardon me, but I'd better check on those miners. At the rate they're going, it'll be another year before they clear that blazing shaft. Yeah, that's what I thought I remembered, was that you could reinvigorate her. Haven't felt this fresh in decades. Need to ask what Hefrick's been putting in the ale. Okay. Hey, Wreath of Ashes is completed. What did we get for it? Revive, ooh, the revive item. Even, oh, it uses seven. Even small quantities of the ashes of Valian Urn have the power to cast reviving exhortation on an ally. Damn, well, we should definitely go grab that at some point. And we've got that important visitor. And we're going to wait until night at some point. Uh, oh, wait, the devil wants to talk. Didn't think there was anything more in lice and hoarfrost to these folk, but you had a look back there. What did you find when you're rooting around like that? Fabric of a soul. You seem rather interested in these villagers all of a sudden. Why? Her eyes slide in their sockets. Mayhap I'm looking for someone. Woodcutter by the name of Harmke. Doesn't have anything to do with Coldmorn, does it? It sure does. Her fingers tighten into fists, the metal squealing and rattling. He was one of them. The mob that destroyed Coldmorn. I tracked him to Starward years ago, but got caught before I could finish my business. Dark iridescent whorls appear and fade on her chest plate. Eat ripples from a metal carapace. Sounds like this one's uh, more personal for you. This man, Harmke? I saw him outside my house the night it burned, staring into the flames the way I see you stare into souls. Her fists clench and loosen in a series of rapid, random movements. I knew it were a fool's errand trying to hunt down every man and woman that carried a torch into cold morn, but I... She twists her head from side to side and holds up a hand, then delicately engraved palm empty but grasping at something. If I knew I got the one responsible for my kin and my hearth, I might quit rest easy. How can you be so sure about this Harmke fellow? I took a good long look that night. Ours was a little place with a yellow door right on the edge of town. He was there. He nodded slowly. Besides, I asked around when I first got to Stalwart. Townsfolk said that all the woodcutters in town put part in the purge. Point of pride for him. A small plume of heat rises from a seam in her skull. What does it have to do with me? I told you he was part of the mob. I spotted him watching my house when it burned. When we find him, I wanted to know he's the one responsible for my home, my parents, my brothers, and sister. One of her thumbs rubs absently at a scratch at her hand. I never thought I'd have a chance to know for sure, but you could look into his soul and find out. You'd be in a watcher and all. Finding out might be getting your hopes up. How'd you feel about a solid hunch instead? I'll do what I can. Mighty fine of you. Mighty fine indeed. Don't know where he dallies these days, but someone in Starwar could tell us. People from little villages, they always know. Uh, find Harmke. Now this is one of those cases where, um, you have the opportunity to push her toward forgiveness in the end, but if you do, you get a significantly less satisfying ending. You know anything about a man called Harmke? Saw him head out some time ago. You can usually find him and some of the others in the russet wood felling trees. Well, what are we waiting for, Stray? Don't worry, we're not looking to murder him or anything, he winks at us. The metal abomination has set her claws deep in your flesh. No good can come of it, Watcher. The only way to be free of revenge is to never pursue it. Turn the other way and never look back. Yeah, that works for some, um, but it's also justice. I mean, 
they are not incompatible, not wholly. So our boy should be over here, as should um, another combat encounter, another challenge encounter, uh, somewhere around this zone. What are you? Wolf pelts. Wolf pelts. And some druid stuff. I don't know where I should be looking. Oh, here's old Dunrid spell sword. Here's old Dunrid. Okay, let's get the crowd control off. Immediately, if possible. Very good. I don't have a really big heal. Is minor intercession supposed to be a big deal? <laughs> Soon we're gonna have the, the grieving mother on our side and she'll be able to do that same spell. I mean, it won't be quite as good from her, but uh, the area of effect will still be huge. What's this? Cape of the Master Mystic. Deflection plus 12, holy shit. That's huge. Um, and there's a head. A sack containing the head of Lenric, leader of the outlaw hunting group known as the Old Dunrid Hunting Lodge. We got a skull. Now, if you equip this, you're at yeah, 109. He's got something else on that's also a reflex plus 5. Oh, that one's gives us a healing bonus. Plus 25% healing received is a lot. Maybe we should keep that on. And we can give this to somebody else, like him. Look at that, 67 to 79. Huge. The Devil of Karak. I'm pretty sure that her target's wandering around in here somewhere. Somewhere. This is Hagar's Cavern. Horse. Hello, horse. I don't think it's going to go well for you out here. It seems cold for a horse by himself. Arctic horse. Not a lot of grazing to be had. You need the support of a hay bale. Where's our target? Where's our target? Come on. We're recording. This is embarrassing. Here, I'll pause it. Here he is, the devil of Karak. It's him, Harmke. I remember that weak chin, those wobbly knees. A weak chin and wobbly knees. Can't be too many people matching that description. How goes it? The elven man emerges into the clearing and freezes, staring at the devil of Karak. For an elf, he's tall and rangy with a weather-beaten face beneath stringy, greasy hair. The others with him turn, glaring and gaping at the bronze golem. Oryx's shadow. What's that wicked thing doing here? Armkis swallows, a lump bobbing in his neck. Why are you so nervous? She's my ally. It's a killer. Look, we don't want no trouble. Just trying to do our work. We'd be much obliged if you'd leave us be and take that thing with you. He looks at the devil with a mixture of terror and loathing. Enough. What do you see, Stray? Is that the man who torched us? The devil sways on her feet, her whole body moving around the axes of her ankles. Though she's talking to us, her attention, a concentrated spear of essence, is focused on him. Do you remember the village of Coldmorn? Everyone does. Let the raid Sarens into the Deerwood. What's that got to do with anything? What are you dallying for? See what's written on the bastard's soul. Let's read it. Together we scatter winter bloom petals on a grave. We see memories. Snow shrouded forests partitioned by fallen pines and firs. Days measured by the steady swing of our axe. There are other moments too, recollections that flare up like a heart's welcoming fire. There are children, spry and lanky like you, but still full of the rowdy energy of youth. Together you scatter winter bloom petals on a grave. We reach deeper into Harmka's soul. Ears roll back. A torch in our left hand bathes our face and shoulder in heat. All around us are other men and women holding other torches, and the mountain air is acrid with the stench of smoke and sweat. Rage billows off the others. It's been a fever in our blood for days now, exhausting us and invigorating us in equal measure. We're at the edge of that town, cold morn. The hour is yet before dawn, but the commotion has started to awaken the village. Candlelight ignites behind frost-curtained windows and haunted faces peer out at us through the glass. We begin to doubt ourselves. Just then a door slams. A villager comes racing through the streets, kicking up snow. With his stark white face and pale hair, he looks almost like a ghost. The line of torchbearers ripples as he gets closer. He 
picks up speed, but nobody moves toward him. We imagine him breaking through the row, shattering our ranks like the bad dream we've brought us all here. We imagine waking up in our bed, the heat from our torch nothing more than the warmth of our wife sleeping next to us. Instead, the villager reaches the row of torchbearers as stones throw away from us. A woman advances from the line and buries her dagger in our neck. The rest of our fellows shout. Rage, memory, and bloodthirsty triumph boils up in us. We all came with a purpose. We came to bring justice to the traitors of Cold Morn. The next few hours are painted in colors more vivid than life. We put our torch to anything that stands and our sword to anyone who runs. It is as if Magran herself whispers in our ear and guides our hand. Exhaustion has almost cooled our rage when we spy a house at the edge of town, one of the only buildings that hasn't already burned. It's flanked by knotty spruce trees and the door is painted yellow. Yellow. The bloom of sunrise. The hue of our sun's hair. The color of cowardice. Just then someone barrels into us from behind. It's a man, someone we remember from a journey to Cold Morn, though we can't remember his name. He snarls at us, mad with indiscriminate rage, and it occurs to us that he's mistaken us for one of the villagers. We smash the window and hurl our torch inside. The other man is turned away. We think we hear a child shriek within the house, but it's impossible to tell above the roar of the riot. Armka shivers as we pull away from his memory. His eyes are wide with guilt and fear. Spit it out, Stray. What did you see? He burned down your house. She stares at Harmke. We hear only a worrying mechanism in her throat, but Harmke leans closer. What did you say? His mouth quivers. What did it feel like? The torch in your hand, the blade you carried. What did they feel like? A wild and human scream echoes out of the bizarre machinery of her throat. It drops Harmke and his companions to their knees where they cry out in terror. Ears squeal and crank as she rushes at him. Yeah, he's a bad man. He did bad thing. <laughs> Gonna murder a bunch of woodcutters now, but they were all involved in the purges. Sorry, sometimes justice catches up to you. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Almost 15 years I've been looking for him. She stares ahead as we approach, the ink black marbles of her eyes fixed on some distant point. Her essence swells and swirls in the throes of contemplation. All that fretting and wondering and the deed's over in less time than it takes to tell. Armka got what he deserved, and that's what matters. I hope Armka's death has brought you peace. Peace. There's a funny word for it. I killed a lot of folk in my time. Thought their blood slick, my hand, slick in my hands, smelled their flesh as it burned. She holds her hands in front of herself as they twitch and spasm. And always I used to imagine what it would be like to have Armka under my knife, feeling his breath come hot and fast, smelling the fear ooze out of him. And couldn't feel a thing. His fading pulse were no more than patter of rain to me. She shrugs, letting her arms clatter to her sides. What do you mean? His body. It weren't made for feeling. Gouging my fingers into arm because wasting flesh, his screams just a buzzing in my skull. She flexes and unflexes her fingers in a few lightning quick motions. All it did was remind me. Of what? This is a madman's fever dream. Like a prison, but no, because in a prison you lay your head down and feel the straw soft beneath you, your flesh prickling in the cold, black bread crumbling on your tongue. She turns her arms in front of her, examining the scrollwork on the backs of her hands with horror and wonder. Uh, you're right, that sounds awful. I still dream I'm folk. I wake up some mornings wondering why I can't feel the floor beneath me, thinking I must have fallen and gone crippled. But then I lift my head. The a bronze corpse stretching out in front of me. She lowers her head. A tremor runs through her. I'm sorry you have to go through with that. It's not pity I want, it's a choice. She draws back from us. I dream too of what Galvino did that night. Those moments, I'd endure another cold morn if it were spare me from this fate. She rubs her hands together, tracing your even joints with her fingertips. What happened exactly? It was after I got caught in Stalwart. They locked me in a little house by the inn, the old mayor and his cronies. Her head dips as she remembers. When a crowd of them came for me in the dark of night, I was only surprised it had taken them so long, she hesitates. Only they didn't march me to no gallows. No, they snuck me to another house at the edge of town, real sneaky-like. That's where I met Calvino. She raises her head, black eyes shining. Calvino was living in Stalwart at the time. True enough. This was before the locals gave him the boot. Still weren't a popular fellow, though. He was fiddling with some machinery in his workshop. Had his sleeves rolled up even though it was cold enough to see your breath. Never actually looked at me until he stared, started fitting some copper helmet over my head. 
By that time, the mayor's goons had had me trussed up good and tight. Galvino was having himself a grand time barking orders at that lot. What did the mayor have to do with this? He'd agreed to hand me over to Galvino for an experiment. She waved her hand at the word, metal flashing. Claimed it was a fair punishment, but the townsfolk weren't too pleased at being denied their stone pitching. She crosses her arms, nodding. Didn't help that they heard the jangle of copper in that deal. In the end, that's what sent Galvino and the old mayor packing. I see. So while Galvino's fastening that helmet over my head and them copper bands around my arms, I'm starting to look at this contraption, and that's when I see it. It's this metal suit, strapped onto the machine just like me. A cold, dead-eyed thing, all done up with fancy carvings and such. You know what they intended. I had this terrible cold feeling in my gut, but I still couldn't figure. She shakes her head. I started asking Galvino and the rest of them what's going on, but they're too busy to answer. Then suddenly they're waiting, staring at me with that fixed, horrified look. But they ain't watching me. They're waiting for something. They're watching for something to happen. Her eyes flicker, rolling and scraping behind her face. Galvino tells the woman nearest the machine to flip the handle. And then, just pain, being torn apart every which way, feeling my soul peeled from my body. Her limbs twitch and shudder. She pauses, waiting for her body to fall still. By the time I came to, I couldn't feel a thing. Just this dull, distant sort of ache. I heard the old man cackling and chattering when I saw him looming over me, looking down at me with hungry eyes. I tried to scream, tried to swing at him. I think that was when I knew. She shakes her head and falls silent. How could anyone put another person through something so terrible? I reckon I'm the wrong person for that sort of question, but if it cools your conscience, Calvino didn't get off easy. The rest of Stalwart didn't take kindly to having a killer in their midst. Not to see in their mayor and the ordinary Valian strike a secret deal. They drove Galvino out, destroyed a fortune in machinery, and wrote a letter to the Academy in Salona, ruining what was left of his name. Still, he's lucky he didn't get a pelting. The old mayor fled, too, and Stalwart's been as snug and cheery as ever. Now we've dealt with Harmka, why have you stuck around? You're better company than Galvino, she says it with an offhanded, teasing voice. She looks away from us, fidgeting with a rivet. Been a while since I were out in the world. Guess I'm keen on seeing more of it, even if I'm stuck with a bleeding heart. Anyway, I've been wondering about that fortress. You're acting unusually coy. She's quiet, fixated on her squeaking joint. Here everyone thinks it'll have just the thing they need. She ticks the list off on her clicking fingers. Those villagers want to fix up their broke-down town. Galvino always thought it carried some great secrets of animants, and all them adventurers came looking for fancy gear. Could be any of those things. What are you hoping to find? I don't know. Something to help me feel. I forget. Effigy's eyes, maybe just something new. The tips of her metal fingers clacked together. I just figured, with those dwarves being expert smiths and all, maybe they had something to unmake me, put me back into my body. Perhaps we'll find something yet. You really think so, huh? Well, I ain't like you to blast hot air. Huh, should we hold on to her for the time? I was gonna cast her back out for the grieving mother, but oops, that was the load button. Uh, what were we even up to just there? We just dealt with the devil. I was thinking maybe we should hold on to her just in case she's got some stuff to say in Durgan's battery. Um, yeah. How long is it going to take us to get to Longwatch Falls? We should probably go and deal with our special visitor in Cadnua first. Fine. Hello, special visitor? You're not here. There's no one here. Where is the person? Where's Azuro? Where's Azuro? Is this Azuro? No, it's a general goods merchant. And we can loot the contents of our very major spellbind armor of faith. Curse of the Menpugra, intellect plus two, charged. Binding of constitution plus two, that's a waste as well, unfortunately. I think that that's... He's already got an important waste on, hasn't he? Or is an important hat? Plus one dexterity, can't go wrong with that. Still holding swap endurance. Uh, where's the resurrect the dead one? There it is, Remembrance Ashes. That should go on our protagonist. The Looking Inward Chime. Invisible, immune to engagement, untargetable, and break engagements. That's pretty cool. Um, neat stuff. The, reed, the Red Reed Wand. My son, do you see your sisters across the moor? Why is it Sister Apostrophe S? Yes. Fortitude plus 18 is a huge bonus. Swap endurance seems like a cool thing to be able to do. Who has the most endurance? She does. 
could she just swap herself for somebody? And they functionally bring a dare back to life from near death? We've got a number of ways to raise the dead now. Kind of cool. What are you wearing on your waist? You're wearing constitution plus three. How about constitution plus two? Oh, you were also wearing that, weren't you? Yeah, we're not going to give you that torque. We're going to give you this ring and this gloves. He's already got the plus melee damage gloves, so that suits him well enough. Let's put these in our quick items, since we never have any quick items. What is this? Potion of mirrored image. Until hit. Meh. I mean, until hit could be useful on somebody who's got high defenses already. Right? Quick save, but is there actually a visitor? Or are we visitorless? It would be a shame to miss the visitor. Ugh, the library upstairs is still trashed. We never got to fix up a library? Did we not fix up a library? The thing we didn't do? Towers, library. We never did the library. We thought we were done. We weren't done at all. The library. Wonderful. Oh, Azuro is, um... He is, uh... The guy who gives us rare buys. So we've just already bought his thing and he's gonna hang around for another, another week. Uh, since we had one day in 25 hours, what? Oh, that's haunted. Who's messaging me? To Walgreens refill? I don't know what he's talking about. Let's gather my party. Hey, Azuro just showed up while he was already here. <laughs> uh... It's exceptional, perception plus two, and athletic. Husk of the great western stag. Uh, sure, I'll buy it, why not? Thanks, Azuro, you were here twice. At once. I appreciate that about you. Uh, we're resting until the library is finished. Because I was shocked, shocked, that it wasn't already complete. Library construction completed. Yeah, we did it. Well, that was embarrassing. Here we were thinking we had a completed palace for the entire time there. And always the library was just hanging out. Undone. Any comment on that? What is the state of the keep? Where to begin? Yeah, nothing to say. Everything is finished. Is there a special sleep, perhaps, now that I have all the sleeps? No, there's nothing that gives me plus three to all stats. That would have been beautiful. Okay. Now, while you mind if I borrow some of that Makachoa? You are searching for insight? No, I was just going to feed it to Durance while he was sleeping and pretend to be the ghost of Aethys. I also have a pepper that will make him think he is being slowly devoured by a great serpent, if you are interested. Should we turn on voice, do you think? Now, like here at the end. Zoop. With most hey. of the voice work done. I wonder what the devil even sounds like. Right here. She sounds like a robot. Right here. Hey. Robot. So we're looking for the dragon cultist, apparently. <laughs> the ooze is paralyzed. Oh, and it's some of the vessels. See that? They're petrified. The annihilating winds of the soul. All right then. Where do you think the dragon cultists are hanging out? Are they hanging out at the dragon? No, it would appear not. Step There's something we can loot here that is not considered stealing, apparently. I guess it is this. And what do we have here? Ooh, Durgan Iron Ingot. Well, we'll find a use for that at some point, I'm sure. Um... Can't get behind him. Can't quite creep in and grab his stuff without hey. his, uh, seeing us. Oh. My hands do not look like that. Whoa. Dragon.
dragon cultist. Oop, there it, that looks like it. True flame. True flame. Leave it! They've got Adrigans among their number, huh? That seems wild. I love that reach. They've got crowns. Prone forever. Ooh, goodbye. You, you. There we go. So we got the two leaders of that. The leaders of those two hellish places. The hunting lodge, right? In Dunrid, right? Put your backs into it. Let's get this up and running. Who's Idurin? Hello, Idurin. The Orlin bows to us. Ah, the adventurer who saved the village. So good of you to visit my humble wagon. I'm Idurin. Would you happen to possess an old helm or a horn that looks like it's supposed to be attached to a helm? He opens a compartment of his wagon and pulls out a cracked horn partially wrapped in cloth. One of the villagers sold me this during a previous visit. He scowls. He said it came from some rare lake creature and was quite valuable. It's been dismissed as junk whenever I've tried to resell it. Yes, it's part of an artifact I'm trying to recover. Ah, so not a bad investment on my part, then. Six hundred pans. Here you go. Why not? The world fades. Nearby are Aldril and Baldrin. Both of them swimming on a distant shore await the other members of our tribe and with them Alara, daughter of the chieftain. It is for her hand that the three of us are competing today. Give up Gara, Dardal passes us, and despite our best efforts, we can't quite catch up. We look around to see where Badrin is, and it's by sheer chance that we catch sight of the sea serpent's head surging toward our group. As we... As before, the world stops, the moment's memory trail lost without our guidance attack the serpent. Our fatigue falls away as we turn to face the serpent. It charges us, its eyes, its jaws wide, its foot-long teeth flashing in the sunlight. At the last moment, we dodge the side as its jaws snap shut. We're a hair too slow, and one of the serpent's horns tears open our forearm to the bone. We grit our teeth, hang on for dear life. Do the only thing we can think of and jam our fist straight through the serpent's eye. It whips in agony as our grip slips. We tumble to the air as our consciousness fades. That race, how could I have forgotten the events of that day? I remember it now, but I feel no different yet. Please, you must find the last part of my helm. Sure. How's business? Poor like this place, not much coin to be made trading in furs and fish. I came to the White March because I assumed there'd be no competition, and I have none, because there's nothing to compete over out here. If you're not making money, why would you stay? I was rather vocal about my inevitable success with my friends and family. If I give up and return with a little more than I left, then... No, it won't be like that. I'm not giving up yet. Show me what you got for sale. An exceptional hunting bow, raiment of wild's eyes. Grants a mirrored image when hit by a crit. I don't love that that much. Uh, much of Tundra clothes. Ultimate hat of alluring perfection. Of might plus two, of constitution plus two, simpleton minus two, intellect and resolve. That's dangerous. Observant. Plus two enemies needed to flank. A bruiser and a follower of Wael. Ring of deflection, Riona's buckle. Balance of accuracy. Plus five accuracy is not bad. If you've got nothing. I'm not sure if he's got anything. Bunch of scrolls. I wonder if we just buy everything he has. If that would um, change his dialogue. <laughs> I'm always wondering about this. Do it. No! Damn it. Oh, I can't afford everything he's got. Oh, well. No. Hey. All right, so one more piece to the hat. White, flame, and sound. Some bounties to turn it over here. I brought you Firedorn's head. That's a relief. Fellow like you, fe fellow like that was bound to cause trouble even if he was crazy. Here, this is for you. A rattling bag of bonies. Here for the old Dunred Hunting Lodge. Thank Galloway. 
You, of course. I'd be honest, I'd worry those fools were going to end up here and burn down the rest of the village. This is a purse that's full to the point of bursting. Afraid I don't have any more bounties. We did it. We saved nature. There's special bounties we could do from, uh, from, what's it called, to, from Kadnua. The hunting lodge. Go after, like, and Ifen's not added. Did we not do the last one? Maybe we forgot. Bounty Lenric. All right, so we've got everything we need now, I think. We can go into Durgan's battery. Chirp, chirp, chirp. You don't make my life hey. easier. Watch and learn. Go for a custom formation. Like that. You know? There we go. Now I can have the protagonist as number one. So I can actually reach him to use his abilities more easily. Probably having Durance as number two would be good as well. Let's see if that yeah. how does that affect the is it is it assigned by character or is it assigned by position? It is assigned by a position. Swap that. Cool. Now my well, my characters who actually have abilities are easy to select. Wait. The Devil of Carrick is being selected with one. Why is she being selected with one? Mm-hmm. Uh, did we just make trouble for ourselves? One is selecting the sixth character. All right, but I ain't responsible for what happens up here. I'm right here. One is still selecting the sixth character. Is it bound on wrong? What? That's very strange. How did that happen? Controls. Those cannot be rebound. Okay. So why don't I what? put these guys as two and three much. then? All right, two and three will do. I don't know why one is selecting the sixth character. Uh huh. Weird. Hey. I don't think it did that historically. You two are up there. Who's the sturdiest? They're all kind of equally sturdy. Oh no, the, she's not at all. She's flimsy. She's quite fragile. Um, maybe I should give her a bow, actually. Can I give her... I don't have any good bow for her, really. Um, I could give her one of the wands. Whatever's highest value, right? So value high to low, what's this? The reed red wand. Accurate three. How about something that's like super fine, you know? Bell stroke. Karak's brand. Uh, spell chance combusting wounds. Does combusting wounds work? Yeah, just take some damage when dealt damage. Praymaker. Accurate three. Accurate three is pretty good. I mean, that's uh, the equivalent of like a superb or a legendary enchantment, I think. 100% damage. So superb is better. Superb is the same as accurate three and on accuracy and three times the damage. You only do that once, of course. Grants plus one to perception. DR reduction time siphon. Time siphon? Grants ambushing, self plus 25. Maybe we should give her this. It's only fine right now, but we could take it all the way up to superb, just to amuse ourselves. And it's got time siphon, whatever that is. Now it's our highest cell value item. Okay, devil. What if I give you this instead? But the pistols are two-handed. That's interesting. Uh, but what does time siphon do? Not gonna tell me. 
Yard reduction, time siphon, stealthy and superb. Hmm. I don't know. Undescribed. Oh, this item is not supposed to have time siphon. That belongs to a unique rapier, and it just increases attack speed and uh, reduces... I don't see the DR... Yeah. Interesting. So we will see, I guess, how the time siphon, if that is indeed happening, because it's not supposed to be on this weapon. It seems like it's a tooltip error more than anything. Attract. Like this? How about like this? We could even bring the rear closer. Of course. Talk to the door. Though the wind and ice have pried long, jagged cracks in the walls, the doors feel as solid and as cold as a glacier. Gilded panels are arranged in columns along the doors, though most depict scenes from daily life. Dwarves chiseling at tunnel walls, hauling minecarts, or feasting at long tables. One painted eye level catches our attention. It's a relief showing a crenellated wall and above it an indentation in the shape of an anvil. Place the anvil tile in the relief. We lost an item. Battery relief tile. Uh, wait, I don't remember what the line was. Walls of the battery safe. I think that's the second one. Hammers of Durgan ring loud, may the anvils deep. What? I struck the anvil relief. Hey. Push the... Uh, strike the warriors. Nope. Okay, that was wrong. Hammers of Durgan ring loud. Push the anvil. Uh, walls of the battery. Press the panel. No. Hammers of Durgan strike the anvil. Walls of the battery. Push the crenellated relief. Hey! Uh, Abaddon's faithful travail. Uh, stick our weapon in the mouth. No. Anvers, strike. Walls, crenellated relief. Abaddon's faithful, examine the mouth more closely. We inhale some of the vapor which leaves us lightheaded. Press the dragon's tongue to light a fire in the mouth. Use our torch to light a fire in the mouth. Whoosh! We did it! Why'd no one else think to read the past? Big doors. We sense the presence of another one of uh, pieces of Garrod's helm nearby. Good thing I'm fresh. Old to place feels like it doesn't want us here. Like a farmer with a good-looking daughter. You can feel it in the air, Watcher. The dead still linger. The dead still linger. We used to sleep in places like this to conquer the fear of death. I do not miss it. The statue of Abaddon is modeled and tarnished, but each bolt and rivet appeared crafted with, appears crafted with meticulous detail. He's so steampunk. Isn't this something? We earned this. Durgan Steel has lined our halls in gold. Your vanity dishonors Abaddon and cheapens us all. This calls for a subtle touch. Quite loud in here for an abandoned fortress. Damn you both! My generation built this keep to honor Abidun, not to further your greed and ambition. We're Pergrunen. Our forefathers explored and conquered, but you've stuck us in this frigid hall. Paved with gold and marble. I won't allow us to abandon our legacy for your delusions. No, you'll peddle it away to line your pockets. How much have you made selling our steel, Zoltan? Again with your lies. You think I don't hear you turning the others against me? These walls echo and... Enough! I'll send the Forge Guardians on both of you if that's what it takes. 
I'm not getting through that. Battery defender. Knock everyone down. Kill everyone outright. Leave it to me. Of course. Hey. Hmm? Hey. Record of production. Here is a current accounting of this month's production. 20 long swords, 15 axes, 12 hammers, 7 maces, 2 flails. 7 full suits of armor for forge guardians, 3 additional suits. The commandant re commandant's remark on production rates kindly remind that we received 3 different work orders from them. Bazal, Master Smith of Durgan's Battery. What does Exandru need so many forge guardians for? Keep an eye on him. They've got to trouble adventurers in years to come. Of course. Suppress this affliction. Calls for there. A subtle touch. What did I tell you? Sturdy. We're collecting gears, sprockets. I wonder what they're for. I think we glimpse flickers of movement in this tarnished, clouded mirror. Battery shield wall. All over. Pools. There's something you don't see every day. Oh, you gotta uh, read the description on those sprockets when next we encounter them. He's a traitor to the battery. We unroll the scroll and see an inventory of weapons and armor, swords, shields, breastplates, and helms. All of this is sold to a Lucan of Dunrid. The bill is signed to Commandant Zoltan, coin master of Durgan's battery. Yeah, I guess he is. No more sprockets? Isn't this something? I just want to see some more sprockets. Encased within a thick sheet of ice, this dwarven corpse has been remarkably preserved. The features are obscured by frost. Clutched in the dwarf's hands is a large cloth-wrapped bundle, perhaps a pack. Hmm. Try to pull the satchel away. Hold the torch to the ice. We're able to reach the satchel. Scroll the restore and a rolled parchment. What's the rolled parchment's deal? Storm collar. Maroon's getting suspicious. I've had her sniffing after Zoltan for uh, for the time being, but she's she'll keep an eye on me. I had the lads for the last shipment in the coal and a cart across the tracks. I'm counting on you to make sure it gets topside. You don't mind getting your hands dirty, right? Gregor. This calls for a subtle touch. Sprockets. Durgan cogwheels. The settlements across the White March use a variety of bronze coins as currency. These cogwheels were used in Durgan's battery. But they were created in a two-part process. The distinctive cog-shaped planchets were cast in bronze. When cooling, they were struck in iron dyes. The coins are still quite valuable in the eastern range due to their high copper content. No, oh, it's just cash. The different types and denomination of currency are cool. She'll bring these walls down around us. I think Josh Sawyer may have said they're hard to do. Like it was a challenge to have the multiple currencies as one currency. Letter to Zoltan, esteemed coin master Zoltan, I write you in anger and bafflement. Have I not been a faithful customer to you? Have I not been fair in my dealings? Yet after all of our business together, your people turn me away like some filthy beggar. I arrived at the battery a fortnight ago, frost in my beard and not a morsel in my belly. Barely had I unhitched the horses when your commandant Exandru came to meet me. The priest told me that I would be made, would be made welcome, but my profane business would not. In short, I would have to leave at first light, my wagons empty. Certain this was but a negotiation tactic. I told Exandru that I would of course see him compensated along with you. He left in a huff, and when I presented myself at the door, it was Commandant Maroon, your arms warden, who met me. She told me to leave at once, that she wouldn't have my coin-grubbing hands tarnishing Durgan's steel. Now, I appreciate forceful bargaining as much as any man of coin, but I was cold, hungry, and put off by her vehemence. So I showed her the letter you sent, inviting me to examine your latest stock of Durgan's steel. Commandant Maroon drove a rapier through the letter and sliced it in two. She then warned me that her blade, a fine weapon indeed, would be the last I ever laid eyes on if I did not hide back down the mountain at once. Never have I endured such humiliation and expense only to return home empty-handed. 
I do not understand what has passed between you and your associates, but I urge you to take charge. I fear the other commandants will be your undoing, indeed that of all of Durgan's battery, if you do not deal with them swiftly and decisively. Decisively, yours. Oh, we didn't know he was Italian until the end. You lucked out. Mestrianito of Cezazo. Cezaro. She'll bring these walls down around I us. Walk unseen. Perhaps. <laughs> Squeak. Drop an ice on us. All right, then. Trap. He'll regret this. Hey, Dirk and Iron Ingot. What's this? Oh, is this the battered helm? Yes. As it has twice before, our vision blurs and fades to black. When it returns, we find ourselves on our knees, a shattered sword in our hand and a broken battered helm in front of us. Our helm. We can feel blood pouring down the side of our face, and we know for certain we will never see a lot of our left eye again. Arrayed around us is a circle of other warriors, some from our tribe, the rest from an enemy tribe. They watch the combat in silence. You're going to die, old man. Our opponent is brash, but young and strong. We still think single combat was a good idea. You do. Last winter's famine took a heavy toll on your tribe, and your warriors were in no shape to fend off an all-out attack from its enemies. Single combat was your tribe's only hope, but not if you lose. Once again, the world stops, the memories trail awaiting our guidance. Take him down with us. We force ourselves to our feet and toss away our broken blade. Summoning the last reserves of energy, we charge our opponent. He's ready for us. His blade bites deep into our side. A mortal blow. He laughs. But the last laugh is ours. We are older and we are slower, but we are still strong. We seize the young warrior's head and with a roar of triumph, snap his neck and drop his corpse in the mud. We remain standing, sheer willpower keeping us up until we're certain we are undisputed victor of the combat. Not until the last of the enemy warriors have left your village that you allow yourselves to collapse. The last thing we ever remember is the hands of our people reaching out to catch us. Yes. Yes, it's all coming back. My sister, my reign, the end. Oh, Garrod looks at his own spectral form with a sad surprise in his eyes, watching it begin to fade. But I've only just seen it. There's been so little time to know what to make of it all. Farewell, Garrod. He sighs. The wheel has no patience, it seems. I entrust my helm to your care. Farewell, my friend. Plus three might and retaliation. Character's hitting self. Yeah, just take some damage. Well, if anybody's got no might enhancing gear, that's a huge boost. I don't think he had any, did he? Resolve. Constitution. And what do we have here? Oh, Ooh, a fancy shield. Major reflection. Ten percent of range attacks are reflected back. That's pretty cool. Have we ever changed up anybody else's shield? Is anybody even using a shield except for Adair anymore? I don't think anyone is. I think everybody yeah. else is full offense. All right then. Isn't this? Whoa! Isn't this something? Nice. Hey. Come on out. Hey. Come on out. Got to survive by any means necessary. 
As we approach the doorway, a wave of essence ripples through the air. The ancient stones grind and groan around us, and a woman's voice echoes from the hall. Stop right there. You must be some merchant come to speak with Zoltan. There's a pause in which the woman's wrathful essence gathers like a storm cloud on the other side of the door. The entire room creaks from the pressure of her presence. Zoltan, another door. Don't look at me, Watcher. Manipulation is your tool, not mine. I can give advice if you wish. This is not my first talking door. I pick the lock, but I think she'll notice. Our illustrious coin master may let you plunder our armory, but I've got other ideas for dealing with your lot. Turn and go before I show you how an arms warden deals with trespassers. Uh, Exandro invited me. I'm meeting him below. Let's see what else she has to say. What's going on here? Pargrun and quarrels are no business of yours, outsider. Her tone is as cold as the icy halls around us. Who are you? I'm Maroon, proud Pargrun and arms warden of Durgan's Battery. And you're answering my questions now. Stone grinds and crumbles at the sound of her voice. I'm just looking around. The ghosts stir, looking around and shivering. Their eyes widen and glow as they light on us, as if they're noticing us for the first time. Just as quickly they gaze away and seem to forget us once more, but now they seem alert. Wary. Leave our halls. Go back to whatever land you hail from. Your foundations were blessed by Abaddon himself. What harm could I possibly you do? You sound like Exandru. At least you're no friend of Zoltan's, then. You may pass, but don't make me regret this. I'll be watching you. Oh. I was just going to interrogate the door. I wasn't looking to solve the thing yet. Each rivet with meticulous detail. Margrin's fire. How long did you kill her? You're not getting to me. Parathis! What are these things? Battery shield wall. The fate of the dwarves of Durgan's battery remained a mystery to fifth scholars for 200 years. What little is known indicated the dwarves had been divided by a great disagreement among their commandants. They locked the doors of the battery and never emerged again. These skeletons of the size of dwarves and the armor they wear was once of excellent quality, much like the legendary Durgan steel. Unlike most skeletons, they fight in organized battle formations. Their skill and discipline in battle makes them formidable foes, as does their sturdy armor. Hmm. Easy does it. Melee damage bonus, plus 10%. I think that's higher than the other one I've got, isn't it? Probably worth more than... Yeah, plus 5% and Whispers of Treason. Versus... Here you have the plus 10%. Oh, that's melee damage. Shit, she's not melee anymore, is she? And did we move him out of melee? No, he's still in melee. But she's our real champ, right? Dexterity plus one gloves, take those. Anyone not wearing gloves? Durance isn't wearing gloves. Hey. Isn't this something? Zoltan's, Zoltan's the only, only one with sense. sense. Anyone hey. who says otherwise is a fool. Hey. A bronze statue of Abaddon stands over in ash and the rusted metal himself. tokens. Of course. Maroon! She hey. won't rest until our corpses decorate the halls! Oh, you know, I think I'm going to get myself busy. So why don't I wrap this up for now? And I will see you soon.